Okay, good uh, morning, good afternoon, good day in all the directions of the globe. Uh, great to, to meet all of you uh, for this uh, second event of the Social Cohesion Seminar Series. Uh, my name is Armin von Schiller. I'm co-lead of the Social Cohesion Project at the German Development Institute, and I'm honored to today moderate the session. Um, actually, my first session, I, for personal reasons, I had to miss the, the first one. Uh, so I'm especially glad to be here today and to finally uh, join this, this series and the second one of hopefully many. Um, what brings us together today um, is the work that colleagues from the World Bank will be presenting. And we look forward to the presentation by Nick Mint, Paul Griezacks, and Marine Gassier. Um, they will be presenting on social cohesion in situation of fragility, conflict, and violence, evidence and emerging approaches. Uh, I think this is a, a great topic in the sense of what brings us together today. This, uh, this, um, this series was, uh, was started by, by the German Development Institute with with the, the World Bank, uh, both of us, out of the idea to bring together this community that is a little bit diffuse and where the researchers sometimes are a little bit uh, not well connected to the practitioners. And there are many debates in research and in policy uh, and in implementation that are uh, in, in this area. And um, we are very, very happy that the World Bank is sharing today this, this thoughts um, that they have brought together on this topic. Um, and I, uh, the few presenters today, I will not go into presenting them individually and all the, the CV. Uh, um, in, in the invitation you had links, I, I encourage you to, to check all the, the background that they are bringing, all the, the experience. Um, and um, so Nicholas Mint, um, Audrey Sachs, and Marine Gassi are presenting common efforts, I understand, by, by them, but also other other um, colleagues in the in the bank to precisely uh, first of all check the uh, if I do this I hope I do this rightly you can correct me and I wrong to to get an overview of what is there in terms of evidence and but think carefully about what this means for uh, operationalizing social cohesion and what this means to to uh, to design and, and implement uh, interventions within the bank activities. Uh, and I am aware that other organizations are in this process too, to think carefully about this. So I think we are all looking forward to, to your presentation. Um, after the presentation, which will take around 30 minutes, uh, Francesco Burki, who is also co uh, working at the German Development Institute as colleague of the Social Cohesion uh, Project, will, be, will act as a discussant with a short input before we move to the broader Q&A session. And I think before I give you, Nick, the floor, and I want to underline that Nick was very involved and is one of the driving, driving forces behind the seminar. So I take this opportunity to say thank you to, to him um, also for this. Um, and before I do that, just on logistics, uh, I see you already did, uh, but Please, everyone, be reminded to mute the microphone while the presentations and feel free to share any thoughts or questions during the presentation in, in the chat. I will keep an eye on that or um, on afterwards in the Q&A. Uh, you're open to, to share that uh, in, in the group or also through the chat. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that, that uh, the presenters and everyone uh, will benefit a lot from the discussions and the inputs that you provide. And with that, I think, Nick, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, Armin, for this very kind introduction and for hosting this event. Um, I should say, first of all, that I really have enjoyed uh, this collaboration with the German Development Institute. I think it's been excellent for us um, at, the, uh, at the bank uh, for people who are thinking about social cohesion and how to use social cohesion in projects to improve development outcomes. Because um, one of the things that the German Development Institute has done is to uh, launch this social cohesion hub. You'll see it right 
behind me here. Uh, and uh, Amin was uh, was too humble to, to sell it, but it's really a great online platform for people to um, exchange ideas, thoughts, literature that's of interest. And as he mentioned in his introductory remarks, it's a very broad and uh, somewhat dispersed community. And I think it provides a really useful sort of anchor for us to, to engage in these conversations. And it's really in that spirit that we have the seminar series, which is intended as a way uh, for us to share some emerging ideas. That's what we're doing today. Uh, the presentation will focus on a paper that we're in the process of drafting. So it is not a finalized paper. That's why you don't have it in the invite. Um, and what we're really looking for today is your thoughts and feedback, criticism by all means, uh, ideas for improving it. Because that's, I think, really the, the value added of having this group of uh, academics, policy, uh, and practitioners come together to think about these issues. So what we're talking about today is social cohesion in particular in situations of fragility, conflict, and violence. This is, the, uh, this is an area of uh, significant importance for the bank uh, within the next 10 years or so. More than half of the world's extreme poor will be living in situations of fragility, conflict, and violence, uh, FCV context, as we call them. And in these situations, we've really, uh, you know, for us as the bank to achieve our goal of uh, eradicating uh, extreme poverty, it means that we have to figure out how to deliver development outcomes effectively in these difficult contexts. Now, social cohesion for us hold some promise as a way to build resilience to shocks and to help communities collaborate uh, for public goods, to collaborate both with one another and with, um, and with government. Uh, if we go to the next slide, you'll see that we have a big agenda for today. We'll keep it to 30 minutes. And so we'll focus a little bit on headline messages uh, rather than going through every detail. Um, I will start by outlining a little bit the objectives and the motivation behind this work um, and then turn over to Marine, who will walk us through the definition and analytical framework we're using, the measurement strategies, and how the paper relates to the broader FCV literature and evidence. And then we'll conclude with my colleague Audrey uh, for some operational perspectives uh, from some experience in the Central Asia region. Um, going right into the sort of objective and motivation, um, there's a in the literature growing uh, recognition, I think, of the importance of social cohesion when it comes to FCV issues, both in terms of uh, sort of gaps in social cohesion as exacerbating risks, but also I think on the more positive side, we have seen in many situations where we have uh, state failures or the absence of sta the state in, in, uh, in specific geographic areas, for example, during times of conflict, a very strong ability of communities to still collaborate uh, deliver essential services, provide some level of um, mutual help and uh, protection networks. And so one thing that, ha that has happened over the past uh, 10 years or so is that a lot of our clients have come to us and have said, how can we build on that? How can we figure out ways to connect the state with these community institutions to, to leverage the ability of collective action at the community level in a way that allows the state to deliver services, for example, when their capacity is limited, when their access is limited because of security concerns, or to deliver services in a way that rebuilds trust between communities and the state following conflict. <laughs> and so that's really what we are looking at, um, at understanding better in this paper that we are drafting right now. The paper uh, we're expecting to finalize in the spring. We've had a concept review meeting um, last month. And so we're sort of in the uh, midway uh, in the process of, uh, of sort of uh, going through the literature, figuring out how to structure our arguments. And what you'll see today is sort of our initial thinking on that um, and our attempt to sort of put some meaning to that broader question. Now, the first thing that we've looked at are the existing frameworks, obviously, um, both uh, sort of around FCV risks and social cohesion. Uh, there was a study in 2018 that was a joint uh, study between the World Bank and the United Nations on pathways for peace. And that was really our first attempt as an institution to think about conflict prevention more proactively, including sort of going beyond the state to look at how to um, work and build on resilience at the community level. And I think it's been a very effective uh, way of thinking about it, but it looks really at society-wide dynamics. And so part of what is missing there is a more localized understanding of community level dynamics, because what we're seeing right now in the conflict landscape is that increasingly conflicts are not sort of, you know, countries versus countries or even sort of full national conflict, but what you have is a much more fractious landscape 
uh, where conflict is either at the subnational level or involves multiple very small actors, right? So, uh, so that uh, I mean, and we have the evidence on this in terms of sort of the average number of actors involved in the conflict in any given country, uh, which has gone way up in the last 20 years. The second thing that we would hope to add uh, in this paper is to help at least for the for the bank colleagues to have one operational definition that can be used as we think about social cohesion in our projects, right? The fact that there's lots of interest in social cohesion has produced diverse perspectives. And I think in many ways, that's good. It's a very broad concept and people use it sort of uh, in slightly different ways, uh, in ways that make uh, most sense and are most relevant to them. And again, I think that's perfectly fine. Now, what we do need at the bank is one operational definition that works for us so that we can then also have a consistent set of measurement around that. Um, and I think that's uh, one of the lessons that we learned from the sort of early attempts by the bank in this space where uh, social cohesion was often defined very broadly. And then uh, the sort of project goals were very ambitious and we were unable to detect much impact. And, and, and I think that uh, caused both a lot of uh, frustration but also some skepticism about how much difference can we really make. And so I think having a clear nuanced operational definition coupled with good measurement strategies is critical in order to advance this topic inside the bank. And so our framing paper really um, will aim to do that. It will be grounded in the overall literature on social cohesion. It'll be aligned with our institutional and operational priorities, and then it'll focus on sound measurement strategies at the project level. Let me turn over to Marie to walk us through a little bit of the analytical framework and the definitions that we're proposing to use. And then again, we'll uh, end with Avi. Thank you. Marie, over to you. Um, thanks a lot, Nick, and good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm really happy to have the opportunity this morning to present this early version of our team's work on conceptualizing social cohesion and also thinking about the role of social cohesion diagnostics and social cohesion measurement in supporting the design of effective operation in context of fragility, conflict, and violence. Um, as Nick mentioned, this is still work in progress at this stage, so I'm excited also to get your thoughts and feedback. Um, so, um, building upon a recent collaboration with other organizations, including Mexico, to measure social cohesion, we propose the following definition which characterizes social cohesion as a sense of shared purpose and trust among members of a given group, trust by group members in um, government official and willingness of group members to engage and cooperate with each other to survive and prosper. So with this definition, we highlight three dimensions of social cohesion. The quality of the relation between members of a given group or community, so that's a bonding dimension, the quality of the relation between members of distinct groups and communities, the bridging dimension. And finally, the quality of the relation between citizen and local state institutions, the linking dimension. So um, this is quite straightforward so far, but when we think about whether and how this dimension travel across different contexts and environments, or how they may help clarify issues fueling different types of conflict, we can quickly run into uh, problems. And so for this reason, we think it's important to deepen the conceptualization of social cohesion. And we, have done, and we are doing so in the papers in two ways. So one is to address the question of what kind of community are we talking about? What a community looks like varies from context, from context, historically. Um, but in most society or all societies, people belong to several distinct kind of like overlapping communities. One distinction we can make is between what is sometimes called imagined communities, famously defined as communities that live in the mind of their members, and these members may have not only never met, but they've never heard of each other, yet they believe that they share a common history, a common destiny, or common interest. Um, and this imagined community are often identity-based. Uh, and we can distinguish them from what, what we can think of as everyday communities whose member interact frequently or regularly at least and who share more immediate interests. For instance, they may have to manage resources together. And so in the paper, we recognize that these different types of communities all matter for social cohesion and for FCV risk. Um, and I'll go back to this in the third part of the presentation, but it's often the interaction between different level of communities that can drive FCV risk. And so one goal of the paper 
is to offer some guidance on how social cohesion diagnostic can identify the right or most relevant level of community to consider. Um, a second way in which we seek to deepen the way we conceive of social cohesion is to acknowledge that social cohesion is not an unambiguous good. Communities can be both highly cohesive and yet organized around inequitable hierarchies. And, and we'll talk more about this, um, in some cases, strong social ties, strong cohesion can help communities engage in more productive collective action, but in other instances, it has also helped armed group and violent actors flourishing. So it's important to recognize this complexity. So to help ground this discussion and highlight its practical implications for operational team, we also, we also propose a framework that details how issues would manifest along each of these dimensions and the type of mechanism that operation may want to focus on to address these issues. So for instance, gaps along the bonding uh, dimensions or relation uh, between members of a given community can manifest as contentious relation, which, manifest, which lead to low level of trust, high level of unpredictability, which in turn like adversely affects investment, economic cooperation. And so for this reason, it might be interesting for operation to seek to promote uh, better nonviolent modes of conflict resolution, which in turn can foster greater trust and predictability in social, but also in economic interaction. Um, gaps along the second, the bridging dimension may manifest as conflict over, over resources between distinct communities that have to share those resources. And this can lead to poor resource management, or it may manifest as exclusion and, disc and discrimination of minorities. And that's why a focus for operation can be to foster better economic and social engagement across communities to ensure more equal access to opportunities. Uh, so, and then turning to the third dimension, so one sign or symptom of gaps in citizen state relation is the emergence of rival entities that take over local governance and rule over local communities. So these rival entities may be depending on the context, insurgent movement, gangs, other type of actor. But this is why it's important to, this highlights the importance of operation that can help reinstate the presence of the state at the local level and reinforce the local state capacity to perform core function, including the provision of security, justice, and basic services. So this is just to give you, a, um, so we have this detailed framework in the papers. This is just to give you a sense or an overview of how we are approaching this. Um, and then we then use this framework as a basis to provide guidance on measurement strategies for operation. So our goal in the discussion of measurement is to provide a set of tools and resources for operational teams to design a measurement strategy that is best suited to their project theory of change and to the context in which it is deployed. So we are not trying to offer like a single measure or a single template. And so as part of this effort, as a first step, we first review a range of methods for primary data collection. So some quantitative, some qualitative. We think that this method are like complementary tools. And for each, we discuss which the dimension of social cohesions are best suited to measure, and then the benefits and challenge of each of them. So I'm just going to give a couple of examples, starting with the quantitative side. For instance, in the paper, we discuss how survey experiments can help measure um, uh, respondent or beneficiary attitudes on sensitive issues. Because the survey experiment provides some anonymity to the respondent, and so they can be useful to measure things like whether the support, they are more likely to support the government or a rival of the government and how this degree of support varies across context or across time. So, so, we, explain, so, we, so we detail how survey experiment can be a good tool to measure the quality of linking. Um, to take another example from the quantitative side, we discuss how some studies you use lab in what is called lab in the field experiments in which participants are invited to play cooperation or voluntary contribution game to assess either the degree and quality of collective action within a group, like people's willingness to cooperate with each other um, within the group, or participants' willingness to engage and cooperate with members of our group. And so we discuss how this tool can be used to measure, like to assess the quality of bonding or bridging. Um, then, like turning, uh, then we also discuss a range of qualitative methods and some 
so classic methods like focus group and interview with key informants, um, considering how they might be better suited to identify the mechanism that sustain or undermine social cohesion rather than as pure measurement tool. And but we include in this discussion some maybe less commonly sort of tools that like participatory research. So for instance, research conducted by observing the meetings of local development committees or research conducted by observing how local institutions adjudicate conflict. Um, and so giving example of interesting studies doing this. And we think that while there are like a lot of biases to overcome, this can be fruitful tools. So that's for the discussion of tools for primary data collection. In the paper, we also review some of the existing data sources that can help team conduct um, preliminary social cohesion diagnostics before they have the opportunity to collect their own data. And so um, among those existing sources, we can count the some of the number of perception-based survey, such as the barometers that exist in different regions of the world and that typically track perception of local state institution, including the justice system, the local government, security forces, uh, willingness to as it also track willingness to cooperate with others, um, access to services, perception of outgroups. And they, like they've actually been used by a number of bank operations and can be really uh, be an interesting tools. Other potential resources include the value surveys, such as the World Value Survey or the, some of the polls and regular survey conducted by Gallup. Um, because we are talking about FCD context, um, a lot can be learned by tracking history, like by from sources that tracks conflict events across geography and time, um, such as ACLED and UCDP, along with the observatories that exist in some countries to track different types of violence. And finally, there are a number of indices that you're probably familiar with that exist to monitor the quality of governance and political freedom, and they can also provide interesting insights. Not so much disaggregated at the subnational level, but they can provide insight into historical trends and so help understand how a society got to a specific point. Um, so given the different tools that exist for data collection, and given the data sources that already exist, um, one, one question is like, how should team identify a design strategy that best suits their needs? And so with, through discussion with operational teams, but also through discussion with our colleagues from the data and analytics team, which we, uh, I wanna really thank for the help, we came up with a measurement continuum. So the premise of this continuum is that to decide how to articulate and situate their measurement strategy, operational team should consider two questions. First, what is the intended use or priority use of the data to be collected? Is it to be used to conduct a diagnostic, to measure trends in social cohesion? Is it, do they need more of like a predictive tools? Uh, that can alert to the risk of conflict escalation? Are they trying to evaluate the impact of the specific intervention of poli and policy? Like all of this will have different method requirements. And then the second question to consider is, what are the dimension of social cohesion that the intervention is most likely to, to, to affect? Um, as I mentioned earlier, for each of the tools we propose, we link them to each of these dimensions and show how they are better suited to capture some than others. Um, that said, our message is not that measurement strategies should focus on one dimension, for instance, pick one and exclude and ignore the others. And this is because we want to remain vigilant and mindful of the possible adverse effects intervention can have on social, on a specific aspect of social cohesion if these interventions are not properly informed by social cohesion diagnostic. Um, so one important consideration that came out of discussion with operational teams is that when the distribution of intervention is not informed by sound diagnostics of the relation between community members, between communities, or even by um, citizen perception of the state, then this intervention can actually create new grievances or fuel existing grievances and possibly exacerbate social gaps. And so 
sound diagnostics, considering all three aspects, are important to ensure that operation in fragile environments follow a do no harm principle. And, and that's a critical first step. step. And then um, an additional, but almost like optional second step is to use this diagnostic to, um, to introduce carefully designed mechanism to achieve gains in social cohesion. Um, so that's for the approach we propose to measurements. And then the same, so the same framework I presented earlier helps us not only guide the discussion of measurements, but also guides how we examine the connection between gaps in social cohesion and uh, FCV risks. So to examine this connection, it's useful to take a small step back and ask what do we mean by FCV risk and what causes the escalation of conflict? Um, so going back to something um, Nick um, highlighted earlier, to understand fragility, violence, and conflict, it's important to understand how the political order in the society or a country may fall apart. But we also need to identify the local dynamics that may allow violent actors to grow their influence. And that's a question on which we have more and more evidence, thanks to a rich literature on conflict processes um, that highlights the importance of local governance as a critical arena of competition between the state and its rivals, and that highlights the role of local dynamics in fueling violent escalation. So for instance, there were a number of studies that were trying to understand the variation within a country at armed groups' ability to expand the influence over, uh, over communities. Like why could they take control of some, but not other communities? And so there's been study conducted in, Col in various environments, Colombia, the Philippines, that show that the more effective pre-existing local institutions are, the better citizens can organize collectively to resist demands and control by armed group. And conversely, when you have inadequate local institutions, they foster a fragile environment in which it's easier for violent actors to reshape the economic, political, and even social organization of local communities in ways that benefit them. Um, and so this literature provides rich insights into how armed groups insert themselves in local disputes and capitalize on local grievances. Um, people who live in conflict-affected communities or communities subjected to high level of violence seek ways to restore some degree of predictability to their lives um, while navigating this unsafe environment. And so they will consider the different actors that claim or want to rule them, and they will turn to those that they believe can best help do so. So one example that I find really interesting and wish we had more time to discuss is the example of, <coughs> excuse me, the Taliban courts in Afghanistan. Like there have been a really fascinating study showing the role of this court um, in allowing the Taliban to expand their control because they issued ruling and land titles that were considered the most likely to be uh, enforced. At the same time, this same literature shows that the local level is not the only one that matters and that fragility is often the result of local disputes. So disputes over um, like hyper-local dispute over resources interacting with broader exclusionary identities and ideologies. So this goes back to the um, earlier discussion of what are the different level of communities and how they interact um, violent actors often flourish when they can combine their involvement in local governance with the ability to draw an ident on identity and norms that structure society-wide cleavages. So in other words, they can draw on both everyday and imagined uh, communities. So we try to detail these mechanisms in the papers. Um, and we also try to, to draw the implication of what we know about this multi-level dynamics for the design of intervention intended to prevent or mitigate FCV challenges. Um, so I just want to point to um, three implications. First, um, there is clear value in investing in local governance as the greater the quality and legitimacy of local institutions, the higher the barrier that actors uh, seeking to violently challenge the order will face. Second, as I said, the local fair is relevant, is, is critical, but not the only relevant level of intervention, which means 
that um, there are several possible entry points for operation and that actually combining mechanism to address local rivalries as they manifest in everyday life with efforts to address society-wide cleavages can, uh, be an, can be important to promote greater resilience to FCB risks. Um, and then another aspect that, I've, um, that I want to introduce is that we know that, um, I mentioned earlier, strong social cohesion can also help arm room flourish because they will draw on existing networks. Um, and so for operation, it's critical to find the right relays and allies locally to, uh, and to, to try and co-opt these allies in their efforts to identify solutions to local conflict. So these are a number of quite theoretical, I mean, grounded in empirical study, but theoretical general mechanism we discuss. And then the question is how to operationalize all of this. Um, and so in the paper, we try to support operationalization in two ways. Um, so one way is we discuss how each dimension um, can contribute to each of the pillar of the World Bank FCV strategies. So many of you in the audience are probably already familiar with the uh, uh, outline and key messages of the strategies. Uh, one aspect I wanna emphasize is these four pillars. So the four pillars of the strategy are preventing violent conflict and interpersonal violence, remaining engaged during conflict and crisis situation, helping countries transition out of fragility and mitigating the spillover of FCV. And so, Dimension by dimension, so let's like for instance for bonding. So I've already talked about the role of uh, community's capacity for collective action in prevention because it can sustain nonviolence dispute resolution, and because it can give communities a kind of collective action capacity necessary to resist encroachment by violent actors. But the paper also discusses its relevance to the other three pillars. So again, going back to something Nick mentioned. The better the community's capacity for collective action, the better we can implement effective community-driven approaches, which can be particularly important in contexts um, where insecurity or limited state capacity preclude other mode of implementation. Um, quickly, because I'm running out of time, restoring trust between individuals after conflict, the third pillar is also critical to post-conflict stability and to post-conflict economic recovery. And then finally, uh, communities' capacity for collective action shapes how, shapes how they adapt to some of the spillovers of conflict, including public health or environmental challenges. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through each dimension by dimension, but what we are trying to do in the paper is to articulate this mechanism clearly to help operational team then articulate clear theory of changes for their projects. Um, and then um, the second way we try to support the operationalization of these insights into the role of social cohesion in mitigating FCV risk is to review recent evidence on what work or doesn't work to support specific dimension of social cohesion. Um, for some reason, um, having issues with changing the slide. Um, so, as I mentioned, um, there've been a number of recent studies showing promising emerging insights that we are reviewing in the paper. So in this review, we include studies that speak to at least one of the three dimension and that have implication for FCV context. We do not exclude studies based on methods, but we make clear distinction by type of evidence. So we don't mix together evidence from randomized control trial and qualitative evidence. Um, in practice, we start with a number of existing uh, recent systematic reviews that have been conducted by others. So here I am showing the overall results from a large systematic review of inter intervention designed to promote social cohesion across communities. So intervention designed to, pro to promote bridging 
And um, this review was uh, conducted by 3IE and provides really a number of interesting insights on what can work to promote uh, different aspects of the relationship between uh, people across communities. And then we build on this uh, existing systematic review and we conduct our own additional review. And so, so far, our efforts have yielded 25 new studies, but we are still expanding the, the, the set of study we are considering. Um, split between evaluation of intervention focused on bonding, bridging, linking. And to close this segment of the presentation, I just want to share a couple of promising existing insights. So one is from a survey in Turkey where they implemented a perspective taking curriculum and they showed that this um, program could really help shift attitudes towards refugees. And this is, um, this is a recent study, but it's, it's um, joining or supporting a growing body on, of research on the potential of uh, uh, perspective taking approaches in changing attitudes towards our group. A second insight that I thought was particularly ex exciting or interesting is a study conducted in Liberia that shows that alternative dispute resolution program um, can be effective to limit the violent escalation of land disputes, so in a post-conflict country. And what's interesting about this study is they've measured the effect immediately after and then eight years later, and there were still um, sustained effects, which I also think is, um, is quite promising. The last piece of evidence I want to discuss is a study of a fairly classical or typical economic support program that was launched in Afghanistan among at-risk youth. Um, but what's really innovative about it is how they went about trying to measure how the program was shifting or not attitudes towards the um, government, a highly sensitive issue. And so it can be a helpful resources for operational teams that are trying to determine whether or not through their operation, uh, gains are being achieved along the linking dimension. Um, so, as I mentioned, like the rest of the paper, the review of the evidence is still work in progress. Actually, we are like open to suggestion. If you have any studies that you think uh, we should consider, please flag them. Um, and then I'm going to stop here and let Audrey give a real and concrete example of how operational teams engage with uh, these challenges. Great. Um, can you go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so I'll be talking about um, the social cohesion results from recent surveys conducted in our Central Asia projects. In Central Asia, the social sustainability and inclusion global practices practice manages five CDD projects the Socioeconomic Resilience Strengthening Project in Tajikistan, the CASA 1000 Community Support Project in Tajikistan and Kyrgyz Republic, the Third Village Investment Project in Kyrgyz Republic, and the Rural Infrastructure Development Project in Uzbekistan. Each of these projects use community-driven development designs to improve access to infrastructure and services in rural communities, and the projects empower communities to prioritize infrastructure investments for project financing. The projects have outreach strategies to ensure that the voices of vulnerable groups within the community, including women, youth, persons with disabilities, and disadvantaged households are an important part of the project decision making. And I'll also add that the CDD designs are relatively new for Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, whereas in Kyrgyz Republic, the VIP, the, third, the village investment project has been operating for over a decade. For four of the five CDD projects, implementing agencies contracted survey firms to administer baseline surveys for the projects. And data collection took place recently from June to October 2021. And all surveys were conducted using tablets and following a very strict COVID-19 protocols. We were really lucky. We, um, we were able to work with Duke University's development lab um, with Eric Wibbles and David Dow to design the surveys, train the implementing agencies and survey firms in data collection, supervise data collection and support data cleaning, 
Um, so all of these efforts ensure that we have, um, and the PIUs have very high quality data collection. The main purpose of the surveys were to provide baseline data for the project's results indicators, um, but the survey instruments were very comprehensive and covered demographics, social cohesion, voice and participation, exposure to shocks, including climate change, social networks, gender norms, and other variables. Um, and respondents were from both households and local government officials. I'll now present a few of the descriptive findings on social cohesion from the Socioeconomic Resilience Strengthening Project in, in Tajikistan that I, um, that I manage. Um, so overall, within the seven districts in SERSP, we observe very high levels of horizontal social cohesion, um, which I'm not, so I wasn't that surprised um, because in a lot of cases, um, the baseline indicators on social cohesion are quite high, and I've seen this in other cases. Over 90% of respondents would allow others in the village to take care of their children. They trust other members in their village. They feel like they are welcomed in the village. They believe they can participate fully in community activities. And they believe that what happens to people in their community will have something to do with their life, a concept we refer to as interconnected fate. Interestingly, only 58% of respondents believe they can play a leadership role. And among these respondents, only 50% of women believe they can play a leadership role compared to 67% for men. And for this particular indicator, we see a lot of um, regional variation. So one district in, in um, Gorno Badakhshan province, which borders Afghanistan, over 90% of respondents believe they can play a leadership role compared to another district in Khatlan, um, in which the survey respondents was only around 45%. And so the next step is to try to understand like the interesting sources of variation in this question. Respondents were asked if something unfortunate happens to a family in a village like serious illness, how likely would they be to help someone? And 86% answered very likely indicating again, high levels of horizontal social cohesion. Around 60% of respondents believe that there are no issues that make it hard for people to work together. And of the 40% who believe there are issues, Around 14% said the main issue that divides people is wealth or education. Respondents were also asked if there were any recent serious disagreements among community members in the village. And of the 50% of respondents who answered yes, the most common source of disagreements was around water or land. Um, so given we have a very rich set of data on social cohesion, conflict, conflict resolution, and other variables, um, we're, we're just starting to analyze the data, but we have a lot more work to do to understand both the descriptive statistics on horizontal and vertical social cohesion and to try to understand the variation in those questions. Um, so we plan to, for example, disaggregate those indicators along all sorts of regional um, dimensions, as well as by sex of the respondent, sex of the household head, um, as well as socioeconomic status. And we also plan to compare the baseline results across the three countries, which is quite unique, because um, in many countries, um, this is the very first comprehensive survey um, with this, these types of modules. Um, so we're excited um, to look to see what's in the data. Um, and then for the project, um, the implementing agency is planning to use the data um, to help inform the community facilitators who are working with community members on the community-driven development project cycle. Um, so for example, the data informs us that in some districts, women may be reluctant to assume re leadership roles. Um, so we'll work with the implementing agency to make sure that facilitators are using a variety of outreach strategies so that women are aware of the roles and feel confident to assume the roles. Um, and we also learned that water and land are common sources of serious disagreements in villages. Um, and so in those villages where communities select water sub projects for project financing um, from the World Bank side will provide extra supervision to make sure that the projects don't contribute to new sources of conflict, but mitigate the conflicts that are already um, in play. Um, so to summarize, the surveys offer a lot of useful operational information on social cohesion, and we look forward to seeing the implementing agencies and facilitators utilize this information for operational purposes. I'll conclude there and thank you.
Thank you so much, Audrey. Thanks so much, Colin. Thanks so much, Nick. Um, lots of materials, lots of things, lots of input. Thank you so much. Lots of uh, things to think about and to discuss. Before we uh, open the q and I would kindly ask uh, Francesco to Gorki to share his, his uh, thoughts um, with us to start the discussion. Um, in order to have a little bit more time for the q and I kindly ask Francesco to, to try to, to uh, be short in order to allow uh, for the broader discussion. Thank you. So thank you, Armin, and um, uh, thank you all the colleagues of the bank uh, for giving me the opportunity to have a look at this very comprehensive strategy and plan that the World Bank has, uh, is conducting at the moment. And uh, let me start by saying that I, I very much welcome this effort of the bank to engage deeply in such an important topic like social cohesion, which is gaining more and more attention, both within academia as well as among uh, policy makers. And uh, I particularly uh, appreciate the attempt to start from a clear, theoretically grounded uh, definition of social cohesion to then uh, try to operationalize it in different uh, directions. So in terms of measurement, but also in terms of developing a diagnostics tool, tool and a framework for the design, uh, for the monitoring and evaluation of project or intervention that uh, aim at enhancing social uh, cohesion. So I will. I, I have only a, a few points. I try to leave more space uh, for the audience to engage in the uh, question and answer uh, session. Uh, the, each the, the point referred to the three, four different parts of the of the study or the presentation. Starting with the definition, the framework. So the, the, I think that the definition that uh, you have used is very well positioned in the existing literature on social cohesion. And then let me also add that it's pretty much uh, in line also with the uh, definition that we have uh, you we are using at uh, the German Dormant Institute and was presented at the first uh, uh, seminar of this series. You basically have three, let's call them dimension, uh, so trust, uh, willingness to cooperate, and what you call sense of shared purpose, uh, which I think uh, to a large extent uh, is similar to what we uh, define inclusive uh, uh, identity. And based on this definition, you develop a conceptual uh, framework, which I think is a very important step forward you have, you have done, uh, because it's very important to have a practical tool uh, to reflect on the type of uh, problems that might occur and might at the same time influence the three different uh, dimensions of social cohesion, and as a concept, uh, consequence, to uh, reflect on the kind of action that can be implemented to address each of these, these problems. One main comment the, uh, and question at the same time that I have, uh, which does not con concern only the first part uh, of the study, but also the following one, what do you really mean by community? Because, I mean, uh, you, you clearly uh, chose the community as a unit of analysis. And I think it's, I understand the point that we, there should be more focus the, uh, on the uh, local, uh, local area, on, on not a uh, local level, sorry, uh, but uh, I think it would be important to provide a clear definition of community. I think in the presentation you said a bit more, but I think it would be important to, under, to really be clear about what a community is, how you define it, because at some certain point you use also terminology community or group. And, uh, and I think this connects a little bit with the, uh, the, the analytical framework, and in particular on the part on bonding, there you, you only uh, talk about uh, gender and intergenerational inequality, but you don't talk there about, uh, for example, uh, conflict inequality among ethnic groups or religious groups. Something that is said appears in the second row of the table uh, uh, when you discuss the bridging, uh, the bridging uh, social equation. This means implicitly, from how I understood it, that you assume that communities are rather homogeneous entities. This could work in certain cases, of course, but might work less in other cases, maybe more urban areas and so on. So I would really uh, think it would, the, the, the study would benefit from a clear definition of uh, community and just more in-depth justification why you use this as a unit of analysis. Um, you discuss uh, the three relationships 
also here sometimes you call them dimensions so it would be good also that you use dimension uh, because you call dimension the tree trust the willingness to cooperate and the sense of a shared purpose other times you call the tree bridging uh, um, uh, bridging linking and uh, bonding social cohesion also dimensions and here you clearly build on the literature on social capital which is perfectly good and uh, helpful. I think it would be good to have a clear definition of the two concepts, you know, social capital and social creation. I think, uh, I think somebody has raised this point also in the chat while you were, were presenting. Uh, one comment I had concerned the vertical aspect of social creation that you defined uh, as relations between citizens and people structured in a position of power. Here, I'm not completely sure uh, what you mean here. If you refer only to the core persistent state or public institutions of, of a country, which is what we do, for example, in our uh, project, research project at the German Development Institute, or also you consider, for example, when you talk about vertical trust, you also talk about trust towards incumbent government. If that's the case, uh, which would be a bit more in line with how I see, uh, with your definition of vertical social cohesion, this would be a slightly different perspective and you would assume implicitly social cohesion is not necessarily so stable over time, but could actually change once uh, there is a change in the, in the government, for, for example. Uh, moving into the second part of measurement, uh, I mean, here you have a very comprehensive agenda and using lots of different types of methods, uh, type of data, and for each of these methods, uh, a wide range of uh, techniques. Uh, and you clearly, of course, uh, have an expertise and knowledge of when to use which. But I think uh, in, for the study, for understanding better the study, it would be good to, to show example of when one or more of these tools uh, in combination, maybe, could or maybe should be used. You, you clearly say that the measurement should depend, for example, on the theory of change of the specific project examined, but maybe you can classify project in different types and provide some just example to make this discussion a, a little bit less general, a bit more concrete. And the question that I have regarding this uh, uh, is a general question. Do you plan to use these tools only for projects that have specifically social cohesion or one of its uh, um, dimension as a clear project goal or also for other type of projects? Because I think it would be really good to know whether other types of projects have uh, unintended effect on social cohesion, which can be, of course, effect in some cases positive, in some cases uh, negative. Moving to the third point, the link between social cohesion and FCB uh, risk, well, I'm not an expert of conflict literature, and uh, from what I can understand, the framework centered on social cohesion uh, used to identify FCB strategy looks quite, uh, quite promising and quite uh, useful, again, in practical, in practical terms. I only see one small challenge, uh, that the linking part of the social cohesion concept uh, seems to me very close to at least some way uh, of uh, conceptualizing uh, state fragility. And if that is the case, you would have, you know, a sort of overlap in the two concepts, uh, which would make uh, uh, the analysis of the relationship between these two concepts, or let's call them a phenomena, a bit complicated. And finally, the last part, uh, uh, what works for social cohesion? Well, I think this is a crucial question and I think it's really really important that uh, you are going to collect uh, you are already doing collecting empirical evidence on what works for this for this point. Um, I reiterate a bit the comment I had before I think even more in this exercise it, uh, it's necessary to focus also on intervention that do not explicitly include the social cohesion or one of its dimension as a goal but could potentially affect it of course when we have data when we have evidence because I think we should bring social cohesion even more into the, uh, into the agenda as a policy objective. To give you just an example, at the German Development Institute, we are currently finalizing a special issue uh, where we, uh, among other things, uh, bring empirical evidence of the effect of social protection schemes on the different attributes of social cohesion. And for all the projects that all the schemes that we are analyzing, in none of the cases, uh, the promotion of social cohesion is a direct objective social protection. So uh, we would not analyze at all this topic if we were sticking only on uh, 
uh, those kind of interventions, in this case, those kind of uh, social protection program that have uh, as a stated objective, uh, the promotion of social cohesion. Of course, this is, uh, this is a challenge uh, and uh, because uh, uh, since social cohesion has until recently at least not received so much attention as a policy goal, uh, well, of course, then there is not so many studies that have examined the impacts of policies in other fields that uh, on specifically on social cohesion. However, as we are discussing here, social cohesion is becoming more and more important. So I'm confident the situation is uh, quickly changing and soon we will have uh, many more studies, much more evidence based on which we can uh, uh, design and implement uh, uh, policies intervention that can enhance uh, social cohesion. So that, that's it, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Francesco. Um, I would give, I would call it the World Bank team, the opportunity to maybe react to Francesco's point shortly and already announced, please, if you have, some of you are already um, sharing through the chat, uh, but also if you raise your, your hand uh, already now, I can start to organize a little bit the discussion afterwards. So, but please first, uh, as I said, World Bank team, uh, any comments, reactions on Francesco's points? Thank you. Thank you, Armin, and, and, and thanks, Francesco. Excellent points and, and really helpful for us as, as we take this forward. Um, I'm also really enjoying the, the comments in the chat. Um, I, I think really thoughtful uh, questions and ideas, uh, and I'm sure that Marine and Audrey uh, are, are looking at those as well. Um, and just want to acknowledge also that uh, I'm very happy that we have uh, representatives from Mercy Corps joining as well, uh, because we did have this collaboration with Mercy Corps um, that really was the first uh, foray for us into this uh, social cohesion uh, part where we collaborated with them to, uh, to develop a, a toolkit for measuring cohesion uh, in projects. And I guess that gets to maybe the first uh, point that I wanted to take from Francesco, which was on this, uh, uh, this question of will we use these measurements only for projects that specifically aim to foster social cohesion, right? And I would say no. I, I, my, my hope would be that we actually look at this across a broader range of projects to understand, you know, how to best use these tools, what, where are they working well, where are they working less well, what are some of the uh, nuances and, and, and some of the uh, calibration that we need to do. Because the way it works in the bank is, uh, you know, having a project that explicitly aims to foster social cohesion means you have to have an indicator on it. And that means that the task team wants to have an indicator where they have a high degree of confidence that they will be able to achieve that. And so uh, looking at this in the context of other projects where we can simply say this is useful for us to understand better the sort of social dimensions of some of our interventions uh, lowers the threshold and, and the sort of uh, perceived risk for teams uh, because nobody wants to end up with a project that sort of fails um, on, 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 this, on the core deliverables. And so my hope is that indeed we you know, can use the toolkit, can use the measurements and the definitions and say, here, you know, let's give this a try in a couple of different contexts, mainly as, as part of also for us building our knowledge of what works and what doesn't, both in terms of interventions and on the measurement side. I think that links to also the, the, the second question then in terms of the measurements and being, being clear about what measurement strategy to use where. And that's actually a part of the paper that we're working on right now. I fully agree. I think that we need to have beyond just be outlining lots of different ways that you can go about measuring cohesion. You need to then have a clear sort of discussion of the pros and cons and the circumstances under which certain approaches work better than others. And that's the part that we're working on right now, including sort of trying also to be fairly pragmatic and say, you know, because it's always in the context of constrained resources, very often in a context of limited access, of course, now during COVID, but also uh, down the line because of security constraints and so on. So then the question is, okay, what can we piggyback on in terms of other data that already exists? What can we do in terms of aligning this with other research methods that are being piloted? And so I think that's really a, a, a focus of the paper as well, so that it's really as operationally useful as possible. And then on the um, question about the linkage to state fragility, um, I, I think that's a really uh, important point. I should have clarified that here we're really looking at the bank's definition of fragility, which um, was updated last year following our new FCV strategy, um, and which basically 
characterizes contexts as fragile or violence affected based on three different criteria, one of which is institutional fragility, where we have a measure of this, uh, which is our uh, CPIA, it's, uh, which is a fairly technical uh, set of measures that really relates to um, in, uh, state institutions, and then uh, active levels of conflict as measured, for example, in the ACLET database. And so our definition of fragility does not, in fact, uh, encompass relationships between citizens and the state. And so in that sense, uh, this uh, would be an uh, addition rather than a sort of duplication of the definitions. Let me maybe turn briefly to Marine for, for some of the questions in particular around uh, the definition of community. Um, and then to Audrey also for the question um, uh, that is in the chat. Over. Um, thank you very much, Nick. And thank you everyone for like the really good points that uh, you raise and gives us a good sense of what we need to further clarify. Um, so I wanted to quickly take up the, there were questions on like, uh, do we clarify the relationship between social capital, social cohesion? Um, and in the paper, yes, we do. We sort of like articulate the connection between social capital, social cohesion, social resilience, social contracts. Um, there is no like definition that pre-exists that is set in stone or a complete consensus, which is why we think it's important to clarify how we approach this. A general definition for social capital is a set of norms and networks that allow people to cooperate with each other. And we see that as one of several inputs that inform um, the three sets of relation or dimensions that inform social cohesion. And then, in, and then we see social resilience and social contract as kind of like outcome or at least downstream from this dimension. Um, so on community, um, I, this is a, something we've like had several discussions about and that we are still struggling with. And I agree that it's an extremely important point. Our approach in the, we wanna produce a paper that will be so useful to operations in different contexts. So Audrey talked about operation in Central Asia, but we also want this to be helpful for people. So it's for teams that are working on projects trying to reduce interpersonal violence in Central America, or teams working in West Africa with head of farmer country. What what the, the kind of both the kind of everyday local community and the kind of society wide cleavage that exists in all of these contexts are quite different. And so our goal is not to come up with like a single definition of community that will work in every context, is to provide a list of questions and guidance for the teams to make the decision regarding what is what are the levels of communities they want to consider um, in their project. So that's kind of like the approach we are going with, which I realize is not fully satisfactory, but we, I, we, I think is uh, maybe more operationally relevant than uh, writing like this is what a community is and, and, and go from there. Um, so I'll stop here and then Nico, Audrey, if you want to add to this. Uh, just to add, um, there was a question on whether projects are monitoring for social cohesion impacts, even though they may not include social cohesion in the results, project development objective or results indicator, and the answer is yes. Um, so none of the projects that I manage include social cohesion indicators in the frameworks or the objectives, but we're still looking to see whether the project's having any unintended positive or negative impacts on social cohesion. Um, and I also just wanted to give a shout out to Demir and the crowd on the phone that did the excellent work on Kyrgyz Republic. Um, the work that we're doing now is building on it. Um, and so thank you so much for the excellent work, which I constantly refer to. And there's also an excellent point on narratives in the chat. And just from my reading of the literature, that one of the most exciting approaches now is um, perspective taking and the use of narratives to evoke mutual empathy between um, different groups. And we've seen it in the context of refugee situations in Sub-Saharan Africa and also um, with um, sexual orientation and gender identity issues in the United States. Um, so thank you for that excellent point to, to which I fully agree, over. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to you also for keeping an eye on the chat that makes my life easier. Uh, we have uh, unfortunately not so much time. We have two persons waiting to share their thoughts with us. So I would propose that we hear both, we collect both contributions and then we, we give the world, the world team a, a, 
uh, last chance to react. Um, so sorry that, uh, yeah, uh, the, we have no more time to, to go deeper into this. Uh, so I have, uh, I hope it's okay to use first names. So Ilan and Hillman, please, uh, Ilan, please go. Uh, was Thanks very much for this marvelous presentation. There's an enormous amount of very rich material and sort of lots of things to think about, but I'm very grateful for it. Just to follow up, I mean, since Audrey made a comment about the narratives and I think expanded on that, just to say that I think there are important and there's a growing awareness in terms of particular the field I work in in sustainability science of the value of narratives as a way of qualitative information in itself that gives insight into the way that norms and perceptions are functioning in a dynamic sense in communities. And at the same time, we're looking at ways that that can become the basis of quantitative modeling or kind of agent-based modeling to get a better sense of the potential for social dynamics that can develop, including of conflict um, and fragmentation of groups. So I just wanted to throw that out there as a uh, domain and a dimension. And we're creating an international platform with a group of, it, of partners, and anybody is welcome to join us in trying to collect narratives, both digital media narratives and the conventional one to many broadcasts, and then develop analytical tools around that. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Tillman? Okay, thank you very much. If I may uh, continue. Um, I also would like to congratulate you on, on a very, very comprehensive and extremely interesting report. Um, just uh, briefly, I, I have uh, two very short questions on, on uh, how you deal with uh, power uh, relations in your, um, in your framework, because the, the, if you talk especially about the linking dimension, um, the state is somehow a, a black box and what we see in developing countries is in, in especially in, in fragile countries is, is very often that the state is captured by political elites that uh, um, a control have so, so control over certain parts of the economy where they ex, 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 extract rents and then use them in ex, to, to create legitimacy in, in exclusive clientelist networks to, to strengthen their, their power base. So when you work with these exclusive political elites you, you, and you approve the citizen state relationship, you may end up strengthening an exclusive type of these relationships. And if you push for including excluded, including excluded community, you may end up destabilizing a stable but unfair setting. So mm -hmm. have you thought about how to deal with this trade-off and also if you measure perceptions as you did in Tajikistan, how do you contextualize those? For example, what I noted is that you, you say that land ownership, for example, does not divide people. Only 2% of people responded that it divides people. But um, land issues are a major source of disagreement for 35% of the respondents. So that means that people are do not dare to question land ownership regimes, although there are frequently land uh, conflicts. No? So, and the same with if 1% of, of, of uh, people only see gender issues as something that may divide people, that may also be underestimating the real conflict potential. So question is, how do you deal with the differences uh, with, uh, between what people respond and what may be structural uh, factors in those economies. Thank you so much, uh, Nick, Audrey, Maureen. Any reactions on that? Uh, I know big questions, uh, very little time, uh, but your thoughts on that, on those issues raised by Ilan and Tim. Audrey, why don't you go ahead with the uh, with the context and and the specific question, and then let me close on on the on the broader question around the the nature of the state. 
Yeah, I think it's an excellent question, and there's no doubt that there's a social desirability bias that's likely to impact um, responses to sensitive questions, including the ones we asked that were asked on the survey. Um, I would encourage researchers um, to look at this issue in more in depth um, because this is an operation. It's it, the as I mentioned in my comments. Um, first and foremost, you know, the objective is to use this survey to for results, framework, and monitoring purposes. Um, but it does raise a host of other questions um, that I do hope researchers will ask. Thank you. Thanks, Audrey. And then let me maybe I'm conscious of time, so I will uh, try. I, I won't try to to provide a comprehensive answer to Tillman's question because I think it's a it's a good one. It's a deep one. I I, I do think that. Um, it is important for us to sort of take this very large set of questions and, and try to have uh, different pieces uh, um, to, to address them. So when it comes to the bank's engagement on, on uh, FCB context, we have a whole set of, um, of, of very deep engagements around sort of uh, equity, around uh, you know, elite capture, around reforms of institutions, around uh, you know, transparency when it comes to budgeting, around equity when it comes to resource transfers, et cetera. And so these are you know, deep and complex and core issues to fragility, I, I fully agree, right? So simply uh, uh, strengthening uh, relationships between citizens and the state won't address those underlying questions of elite capture, of inequity, um, and it won't help in, in situations where governments are the drivers of fragility because they are uh, extracting resources for their own political ends, right? I do think that, they, that, that these approaches can help in a subset of fragile state uh, situations where we have governments that, for example, um, the situation we had in Myanmar in 2013, right, where you had a new government come in that wanted to demonstrate to large parts of the population that it would now engage differently uh, than the previous military government had. And, and that focused around recognizing the reality of rural poverty uh, and prioritizing it in government spending and then shifting decision-making authority from the state to uh, communities. And all three of those are really fundamental shifts, but a big part of what the government at the time was asking was how do we best signal that we're serious about this, right? I mean, they, they sort of make the speeches, they, 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 they print the posters, right? But for them, it was really about how do we get people to believe that this is true? And, and so that was where this, you know, let's actually transfer uh, grants to communities for them to make decisions was a big part of that. And then the question they asked us is, okay, if we do that, how do we measure whether it's working or not, right? And that's sort of where that conversation uh, originated in terms of saying, okay, let's let's figure out how to measure that. So again, this isn't uh, a silver bullet. It's not appropriate in all FCB contexts. I do think it has a role to play in a subset of those. Um, with that, um, let me uh, let me turn it back to to Armin and, and thank all of you for for an excellent discussion. I really enjoyed also all the comments and contributions in the chat. Uh, Armin, over to you. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, so um, we are running a little bit over time. That's uh, my responsibility, so I apologize for that. Uh, I, I just want to take one minute to uh, thank you all for participating, but especially Nick, Audrey, and Maureen for sharing with them their, uh, their draft ideas, sharing with them the process they're undergoing and, and sharing this uh, to, in order to have this discussion. And uh, Nick was talking a lot about having conversations, and I think that is the idea also of this this seminar. So it's uh, really really great uh, to to have had the have had the opportunity to discuss this with you. Um, thank you, as I said, to everyone also for the active participation. Also in the chat, lots of of references. So please, if you have not done so yet, take a look. Uh, I think there's, there is a, a lot of information in there. Uh, thank you also for that. And uh, before I close, I just wanted to say that um, the idea of uh, um, World Bank and DIE is to, to, uh, to keep on with the seminar series. So we look forward in the year 2022 to continue with this uh, event. And uh, we are very grateful for the great feedback and appreciation. I think we, 
we confirm that there is an appetite for this kind of forum and uh, we are very grateful for that. And if you have uh, ideas or you want to present some of the work you're doing in these areas, please contact us um, so that, that we can, uh, yeah, the, the idea is creating this forum in order to work for us. So it's all of us, uh, uh, it's good for us to hear what you, you want to have in this, in this forum to be discussed. Uh, so looking also forward to your, to your ideas on, on that front. And with that, I hope on the 7th of December, it's okay to already wish everyone a happy holiday season. <laughs> so I'm not, I don't know if I'm the first one to do so, but in any case, I use this opportunity to do that and uh, look forward to see you uh, the latest in the next event of the seminar series. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you.